I was born in 1987, and uh, people who were born around the same time as me usually have a collective name for ourselves, whether it's 90s kids, or now that we've all grown up and entered the workforce for the last decade, maybe it's millennials. I was always kind of partial to Gen Y myself, but what you gonna do? Now, there's nothing inherently special about growing up in the 90s or the 80s or the 70s or the 2000s, but one of the defining characteristics of the last 10, 15 years of the 20th century was the dramatic rise of digital technology. The World Wide Web, high definition television, DVDs, MP3s, and a whole slew of devices and formats that would have been entirely unrecognizable just a few years earlier. And among those technological advancements was the revival and firm establishment of the video game industry. It was something of a passing fad spun off from the burgeoning home computing industry industry entering the 80s, especially when the world of video games came to a screeching halt in 1983. But by 85, it had been reborn and would continue to grow unfettered for decades to come. Not only that, but electronic handheld devices suddenly began to appear in greater numbers as well, creating their own market along the way. A market that would come to be dominated by the same names that were taking over home consoles as well. And before Nintendo took the world by storm with the Game Boy, there was another king of the handheld ring. And along the way, it tore a family apart, rewrote the book on copyright infringement, and set an entire industry into motion. The story begins in Vernon Hills, Illinois, a Chicago suburb of about 7,000 people back in 1978. What started there 42 years ago would go on to become one of the most ubiquitous children's brands the world would ever know. But like with Nintendo and Sega, Tiger Electronics didn't start out quite the way you might expect today. When it was first founded by Gerald Rissman and his sons Randy, Arnold, and Samuel, they were in the business of making phonographs and record players. In fact, just a few years ago, back in 2016, one such item branded with the insignias of the rock band KISS sold on eBay for over $4,000. See, we talk a lot about video games and the consoles they live on, and even at times the artists and developers behind those works. But Tiger Electronics was a different sort of company. What often caught the eye of consumers and investors alike was their uncanny ability to pull off lucrative, wildly successful licensing deals. They soon found themselves expanding into other markets, eventually landing in the new territory of home console video game development. In the early 80s, Tiger's subsidiary, Tiger Vision, because everything was something Vision at the time, was developing and porting games for Atari, Commodore, and Texas Instruments, which at one point saw them intersect with a truly fascinating piece of video game history. In 1982, mere moments before the floor fell out from under the entire video game industry, Universal City Studios was looking for a way in. In April of that year, Universal President Sid Sheinberg caught wind of the massive success that was Nintendo's Donkey Kong, and, suspecting the game may have been an unauthorized use of the King Kong intellectual property, had the vice president of his legal department, Robert Hadle, look into the matter. What he found, as you could probably guess, is that the game centers on a massive gorilla kidnapping a young woman and escaping through the city climbing upward until he finally falls, crashing to the ground. Or, in other words, cha-ching, lawsuit time! <laughs> What followed from here was Universal spinning around in the room, throwing punches at anyone within reach. To start with, Scheinberg found out that Nintendo had a licensing agreement with Coleco to develop home console parts of Donkey Kong, starting with a pack-in title for their new ColecoVision, launching that August, and scheduled a meeting with Coleco President Arnold Greenberg on April 27th. Greenberg assumed it was a meeting to discuss possible investment in Coleco, but instead was threatened with a lawsuit if the ColecoVision shipped with Donkey Kong. Followed up the next day with a cease and desist to both Nintendo and Coleco, complete with a 48-hour ultimatum to destroy all Donkey Kong inventory and fork over all profits made from the title. Around the same time, Hadel discovered that there actually was a King Kong video game being developed by Tiger Electronics. Yeah, but they did have permission and licensing to do it, not that that stopped Universal from getting even more involved. 
On May 4th, Scheinberg had Tiger send along their game to be reviewed further, and imagine the ice running through his veins when he looks down at the game and, oh fuck, it's Donkey Kong. It's literally just Donkey Kong. Fuck, shit, fuck. Somehow, without anyone else becoming aware of it, Tiger was developing a Donkey Kong clone with the King Kong name that had been greenlight at some point by Universal. Meanwhile, on May 5th, the following day, Greenberg acquiesced and agreed to pay Universal 3% royalties of all net profits for their home version of Donkey Kong and signed an agreement stating that Universal would not sue Coleco so long as the royalties were upheld. Nintendo, on the other hand, found itself filled with determination, assuring head of Nintendo of America Minoru Arakawa that this was a sign the company had finally hit the big time. Nintendo attorney Howard Lincoln and Arakawa met with representatives of Coleco and Universal on May 6th, with Hadel among those present. Hadel insisted that Donkey Kong was infringing, but Lincoln came prepared, stating that there were several instances of actual unlicensed King Kong games that Universal wasn't combating. Greenberg of Coleco tried to convince Nintendo to sign a similar licensing agreement they had, but didn't actually tell Nintendo that they were already on board themselves. But by the end, Nintendo demanded hard proof. Hadel assured them that he would send a chain of title to Nintendo, which would highlight the passage of ownership of the King Kong property, but the document never materialized. Instead, just two days after that, Scheinberg revoked Tiger's license to the King Kong name, prompting Randy Rissman to retort that Universal didn't even own the King Kong name in the first place. Which seems like the absolute craziest possible retort in a situation like that, right? Nuh-uh, you can't make me. Except, spoiler, he was actually right. Howard Lincoln did his homework too, and after a few weeks of determining that no, Universal didn't actually have the rights to anything they were accusing Nintendo of infringing, rang up Scheinberg and asked what the holdup was on the chain of title. Scheinberg ignored the request and went back to demanding royalties. So Nintendo set up a meeting with Scheinberg on May 21st. Scheinberg had been convinced by Hadel that he finally won out, but was stunned to be greeted by Arakawa and Lincoln arriving on the scene explicitly and solely to tell him to his face that they wouldn't budge. Scheinberg was reportedly shocked. Now officially sweating bullets since they were approaching an actual court date while actively producing copyright infringing titles, Hadel frantically sought to get a hold of Rissman to both make his King Kong game more distinct from Donkey Kong, as well as remove that pesky exclusivity contract so he could, hypothetically, have it published by anyone. Rissman said, all right, and by mid-June the bare minimum of alterations were made to distinguish the two. Sort of. On June 29th, Universal finally sued Nintendo, and on January 3rd of the following year began threatening their licensees as well, threatening seven different companies to either immediately cease their use of the character, pay royalties to Universal, or be sued. Of the seven, the only company to stand their ground was board game manufacturer Milton Bradley. Maybe Ralston Purina too, it's, it's a little unclear there. What followed was a landmark legal battle, featuring a very successful lawyer working on behalf of Nintendo named John Joseph Kirby Jr., who, in one of the all-time greatest clapbacks, referred to another lawsuit by Universal in 1975, in which they successfully defeated RKO by proving that the copyright on the original King Kong had expired, making both the story and its characters part of the public domain. In short, not only were the rights spread across at least three separate parties, no one could claim ownership of the story of King Kong. Thanks for the assist, Universal. Another two years of repeated appeals and counterclaims followed, but in the end, the ruling that Nintendo receive all of Universal's licensing profits was upheld. There was a notable opportunity for both Nintendo and Tiger to technically sue each other over this whole mishap, but they both opted not to. Whether it was because they weren't sure they'd win the case or not is up for debate, but both companies ultimately benefited greatly from not bothering to step into the legal ring one more time. Nintendo was suddenly not just the creator of one of the most popular arcade games of all time, but now they were a household name and a developer that was able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the film industry. And they never forgot the efforts of John Kirby either, opting to gift him a $30,000 sailboat named the Donkey Kong, as well as renaming the hero of an eventual Game Boy action platformer from Popopo to Kirby. And that was Universal v Nintendo. Wait, what were we talking about? Tiger Electronics, right. Um, whether it was a direct result of being tied into that massive legal quagmire or not, in 1986, Gerald Rissman and his son Samuel decided to withdraw from Tiger Electronics, selling their shares in the company back to Tiger and over to Arnold, respectively. This shift left Randy in charge of the business with two-thirds of the shares, while Arnold preferred to work as a salesman for the company with the remaining one-third. And as the 90s kicked into gear, Tiger's toy lineup would become even more popular than before. For example, everyone remember Home Alone 2 Lost in New York? Howdy do, this is Peter McAllister, the father. I'd like a hotel room, please, with an extra large bed, a TV, 
I'm one of those little refrigerators you have to open with a key. Credit card? You got it. Plaza Hotel Reservations, may I help you? How do you do? This is Peter McAllister. The father. Yes, sir. I'd like a hotel room, please. Yes. With an extra large bed, a TV, and one of those little refrigerators you have to open with a key. Yes, sir. You'll need a major credit card upon check-in. Credit card? You got it. What Kevin McAllister is holding there is known as the Talk Boy, a cool variable speed cassette recorder and player. It was also fictional. That's right, the Talk Boy Macaulay Macaulay Culkin Culkin wields throughout the movie was actually just a prop commissioned from Tiger Electronics by John Hughes in 20th Century Fox. But when they finished it, Tiger requested permission to sell a retail version of the prop, and lo and behold, the easiest way in the world to annoy your siblings was born. Hi kids, we're home early. Tiger's Talk Boy tape recorder comes with audio cassette. Batteries not included. That same year, Tiger reintroduced the Mego Corporation's 1970s robot, 2XL, the smartest toy robot in the world. It's really hard to overstate just how popular this guy was for like a year. He was actually the spokes robot for Michael Jordan from 1992 to 1993, and he had his own TV show called Pick Your Brain from 1993 to 1994, hosted by this horrifying giant mutant version. Though it's still a much better look than the original Mego model from the 70s. You ever seen Argo? Right there, right at the end of the movie. That's what that looked like. Anyway. Around this time, Tectoy, the Brazilian manufacturer of the Sega Master System from 1987 through today, approached Tiger to assist in developing a monochromatic handheld system for Sega, since the Game Gear was struggling to get a good foothold competing against Nintendo's Game Boy. Tiger, always eager to build something new and work with Sega, responded that if the price point for the system was right, they were in. Sega said no. They weren't interested in anything that wasn't full color. The Game Gear was discontinued in 1997, never having caught up to the Game Boy. 1995 saw Tiger developing Lights Out, a puzzle game that I was absolutely shocked to learn was younger than I am by almost a decade. The player is presented with a 5x5 grid of lights and must turn out all the lights by touching one, reversing the on-off state of it and any other adjacent lights as well. Right around the same time, they also made the most monumentally bizarre business decision, beat Nintendo's Virtual Boy to the punch in every negative way possible. Introducing the Tiger R Zone, a head-mounted, mirror-projected, red-only LCD game system. It was not received well. You have to really be going out of your way to fail on purpose in order to wind up being unfavorably compared to this thing. But uh, yeah, go Tiger, you did it. And closing out the year, Tiger acquired the toy division of Texas Instruments, putting them in a position to manufacture and make electronic toys for Sega and Hasbro, which had actually just finished absorbing Milton Bradley the previous year. In 96, they came up with Brain Warp, a wildly popular electronic toy that took the form of a sort of exploded six-sided die, kind of? There were six game modes that all revolved around reaction time and rotating the toy to display the correct side face up, based on the color or number printed on it. They also found themselves producing a fictional toy for the real world again, this time replicating the Turbo Man doll from 1996's Schwarzenegger Sinbad comedy Jingle All the Way. It wasn't a perfect recreation like with the Talk Boy, but pretty damn close for a company that didn't really deal much in action figures. Now this might seem like it was smooth sailing for Tiger, but stormy seas were on the horizon for the Rissman family. As time went on, Randy Rissman had been making slow progress on securing his singular control of the company over his brother. Among other more subtle moves, near the end of 96, he eliminated cumulative voting inside the company, which prevented his brother Arnold from being able to use his part ownership of the company to elect himself to the board, something he had opted not to do after the rest of the family left the business, but the repeated ostracization formed a rift between the brothers that would continue to grow. And it culminated in a falling out between the two in May of 1997, with Arnold finally deciding to sell his shares and leave the company, bringing in $17 million on his way out. I don't know what the exact last straw was, but I'd like to think it was the upcoming release of the Tiger Gamecom that August. It was a terrible, awful idea that was basically a mashup of a clunky, slow, unresponsive Game Boy and a clunky, slow, and unresponsive PDA. We've actually played a few Gamecom games on the channel, ranging from surprisingly playable, he's easy to get around with, I guess for the second guy we may as well actually Nope. They just follow wow, you. Oh, they actually have legit, like, persistence across screens, too. Like, this is some real legwork for the fucking Gamecom. I would never have anticipated it being this 
like I hesitate to say <laughs> well put together, but really, but yeah, yeah. Compared to Sonic Jam, this is actually pretty impressive. <laughs> for yeah, no, I'll shitty say even out of three off. screens. Sorry, so I've got a shotgun. Yep. Supposedly. I got a shotgun. Too unspeakable sacrilege. You this is dash. unplayable. You can spin oh dash. My God. Look at this. Wow. <laughs> Did it run better on the native Did game console? No. Just... This is this is running about accurate. Oh. I'm just gonna spin that. Also, what <laughs> what level is this trying to be? <laughs> oh my oh. God! Listen, that soundtrack. Oh my God! And you can't. I even, can't go. You can't. Just walk. Just walk. You, oh. You can't. Oh my God! You're stuck oh. forever. Do it. Do well, it. Don't. You can do it. You can totally I'm do serious. it. I'm serious. This is the only way you could do it. No, like here you go. You got it. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> zoom. Zoom. Dash. Dash while you're going down. <laughs> zoom. Fall down. Fall down. Why is this <laughs> like this? Perhaps that error in judgment was what led Tiger to sell its assets to Hasbro in the summer of 2008 to the tune of $335 million. And Hasbro was surely pleased with the deal as that holiday season marked the release of one of the most infamously annoying viral toys to hit store shelves, supplanting and succeeding the crazes of 1995's Beanie Babies and 96 and 97's Tickle Me Elmo, the Furby. I usually try to make sure to go as in-depth as I reasonably can when it comes to videos like these, but I think it would be literally impossible to have no awareness at all about what Furbies are. And yes, I said are, not, were. These chatterboxes got brought back in 2005 and again in a more LCD form in 2012. I still have nightmares sometimes. Childhood. Lying in bed. Awake at night. Unable to sleep. Noises through the wall, my sister's closet, a discarded toy running on a battery that would never run out, going all. And that brings us to the sad conclusion of the Rissman family. In 2000, Arnold Rissman sued his brother Randy to the tune of $95 million. He alleged that Randy deceived him into thinking the company would never be sold, allowing him to sell his shares unaware and screwing him out of a sizable stack of money. Randy had refused to put it in writing that he'd never sell the company and keep it family run, but he had told Arnold that there were no offers that he was aware of, whether that was indeed the case or not. The court ultimately ruled in favor of Randy, and Arnold, despite appealing the decision in the Seventh Circuit, walked away with nothing. Well, I mean, the $17 million he already had, but not, you know, the $112 million that he felt he was owed. In the 2000s, Tiger was licensed to Yahoo for a while and kept making electronic toys, but slowly started to fade into obscurity, making sure to make one last very loud mistake with the Gizmondo in 2005. As of 2012, they were considered more or less defunct. But hey, good news! This fall, Hasbro was going to be re-releasing a handful of the old Tiger Electronics LCD games from the 80s and 90s, so there's something to look forward to. Oh god, we skipped right over that. That's a pretty big chunk of it too. This video has already gotten pretty long, so I think we're gonna come back next time and we'll talk all about Tiger's domination of the handheld market before Nintendo ever entered the fray. And I got just the games that we can try out too. See you next time. Get on it. 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 Get on it.